joining us here over the next few minutes, but in the interest of time, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and get started. Um, it's, it's my pleasure to have uh, Professor Melissa Bregner joining us today. Um, she is the Robert C. Evans Endowed Professor of Business Administration and the Director of the Initiative for Qualitative Research and Innovation and Entrepreneurship, or INQUIRE, and an Area Chair of Strategy, Entrepreneurship, and International Business. Uh, many of us in the entrepreneurial ecosystem have gotten to know Dr. Bregner over the last few years. She's um, been a generous advisor uh, to many of us as we think about how we continue to invest in and uh, cultivate our entrepreneurial ecosystem. I had the privilege of being at uh, Dr. Bregner's investiture as the Robert C. Evans Endowed Professor of Business Administration, and I was struck by one of the comments from her colleagues who described her as wise. Mainly because that is a rare compliment that uh, we hear um, uh, given. And, and I think it struck me also because of how accurate I felt it was. And um, given that humility uh, often accompanies uh, wisdom, I'm sure I'm making her uncomfortable by uh, by um, sharing that, that, that comment, but, but truly I think it's, it's a real privilege for us to have uh, Dr. Bregner uh, joining us today to talk to us about uh, founding teams. So with that, Dr. Bregner. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gerald. We have a mutual admiration society. We say all sorts of the, the same things about him. Um, so thank you so much for inviting me here today uh, to talk about something that I think is really, really important and often um, underestimated by people that are starting companies, which is how do you build your team and how do you manage your team under all of the stress and uncertainty that, that startup teams have. Um, I was hoping to start, I know everyone's trying to eat now, but um, I wanted to start by actually asking uh, those of you that are starting ventures right now a little bit about where you are in your team formation process so I can gauge um, some of the questions and challenges you might be having. Uh, and this is actually part one of a, a two-part series. I was uh, kindly asked to, to come back again next week. So um, if there are things that are on your minds that I'm not presenting about today, I'll try to cover those next week. So, we can pick on some for you. Okay, Laura, pick on some folks for me. Nina sitting next to me, so I'm going to go to Nina. Now I'll say I'm going to go to Manfredo next from Cross Defense, so you'll be out of depth. And then maybe Jorge. Jorge from Cohesive, you're next. There'll be three, three, different, three different examples. Okay, that's awesome. And if you could kind of cover the, the questions uh, just give me a sense of you know where you are and what your team looks like right now. Sure. So my name is Nina Covery, and I am the sole founder of my company Answers Inc. And um, we currently have um, two scientists. There's also my husband who works part time. I have a, a advisor as a consultant, and I'm working with student interns to build out software as a service product. Right now, we're expanding to kind of two full-time software engineers. Um, so we're thinking of doing that overseas. So, um, and I spend a lot of time on product development and very little free time in the market. And just right now, I'm trying to figure out how to grow in a in a way that maybe frees up, you know, maybe frees up more of my time for marketing or bringing some more people onto the team to help me with the sales channels and expanding the. That way, so and that's where I am right now. And a civil engineer. Oh, I'm a, yeah, I'm an environmental engineer. So my company, we're, we're developing a software as a service, or we have developed more wastewater treatment management. And I've spent 20 years of my career as a wastewater treatment engineer, building and designing wastewater treatment plants. So that's my expertise. And now I'm building a software product um, for that domain. So, um, and my, my background is as an environmental engineer. And what does that ownership of the, the venture 
It's 100% owned by me, and by me so far. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you.
Investors really want a team that they have confidence can recognize when they need to pivot and, and actually um, pull that off. So to give you some data behind this, um, there was a study that was published a few years ago that was done by um, some finance professors. And they surveyed almost 900 uh, institutional venture capitalists. And they asked them how important different factors were in their decisions. And I realize this is quite small, but you can see um, the percentage of the people they surveyed that listed the team as important to their investment decision was, it was the highest of all the things they asked about. And uh, it was over 90%, and in most cases over 95%. So it ranked higher in terms of being checked as important than the business model, the product, the market, the industry, um, the valuation, and then sort of the fit and ability to, to add value from that venture capital firm. So they also asked not just is this important, yes or no, but what is the most important? Uh, and you can see here that, uh, once again, the team comes out on top. So when they were forced to choose one of those half a dozen components, uh, and which was the most important to their decision, the team came up more often than any of the others by a wide margin. So you're going to start to see a pattern here. Uh, when they asked the venture capitalists not just what matters to your initial decision, but what's the most important factor in making investments successful, once again, um, the team came up at the top by a wide margin. And then when they asked them, well, what were the most important causes of failure in your failed investments, team, again, uh, is on top. So you're, you're getting the idea here that from the investor's perspective, the team is not only important, but actually is more important than all of the other components of your venture. Um, and you know, venture capitalists have a particular view. It's not the only view, but it's certainly an important view if you're trying to raise money. So when we talk about the team, um, it's a little bit more complicated for ventures than it is in an established business, where it's quite clear who's in and who's out. You know, who's a full-time employee of Google uh, and who isn't. So obviously you have the founders that are the core of the team. Sometimes it's the founder, just one person. Uh, and then as you grow, you're going to add employees. But there are other components that are really important to think about. If you view the team as all of the individuals that are really involved in making your venture a success. So you also have a board of directors. Um, and you have advisors, which might be formalized as an advisory board that are compensated in some way, that have some equity, or it might just be people that are informal advisors. So we have this kind of broader concept of who are the people that, that really matter to your team. The other thing that makes venture teams a little bit different compared to, say, the top management team of a, a large company is it tends to be very fluid. So you are hopefully growing and adding new employees. As you raise money, um, you're likely to add people to a board of directors. Sometimes as the venture grows and you take on new investors, people that were on the board in the past will roll off. So you have coming and going um, from the board of directors. You also have some transitions in the founding team. So some folks that are involved early on, either they're faculty that want to go back to being faculty, or they're people whose skill sets don't grow along with the venture, and so they're just not the right person anymore. Um, you'll have some founders that, that leave, and they may go into a different kind of a role, like as an advisor. Advisors also will come and go. Um, and some of your employees aren't going to work out. 
And this is important to think about ahead of time. First, when you hire them, you think they will work out. Otherwise, you wouldn't have hired them. But for a variety of reasons, not all of them will. And so there are implications of that for how you uh, compensate employees, and especially how you divvy out um, equity, and whether you want to give employees equity. So that's sort of the concept of, of the team, the way that I think about it. And I wanted to put up um, a couple of slides about academic entrepreneurship in particular, since uh, some of you, maybe most of you, have some kind of faculty involvement. Um, and when we think about startups that come out of universities and university research, oftentimes a faculty member is not the person that's going to be the driving force that's really leading the venture going forward, which makes the team all the more important. So this was a, a study that was done just looking at the composition of um, university inventions that turned into to startups, what was the, the roles played by faculty and by PhDs or postdocs. Um, and you can see that most commonly, faculty end up being an advisor. They might be a founder advisor or non-founder advisor. Um, but it's relatively rare for a faculty member to end up being the CEO or other top management team. Um, so they really need a very strong team to be carrying that forward. And oftentimes, that will include someone that was a graduate student, a PhD student, or a postdoc. So that's sort of the, the first team member that often gets added to those kinds of, of ventures. Um, this is just another way of looking at it. Um, so if you look at founder roles, the vast majority of advisors are faculty, it's almost 90%. The vast majority of CEOs tend to be PhD students or postdocs about 80%. And for chief technology or chief science officer, again, we see that it's most likely that that person's a PhD or a postdoc. So that seems to be the model that works best for a lot of teams. That being said, there are a few different ways to organize academic entrepreneurial teams. And I'm curious whether these models that I'll, I'll introduce to you sound familiar to any of you, but there was an interesting study that was done that was case studies of nine different ventures that we followed for a pretty long period of time, for five years, and the researchers looked at how did they kind of organize their teams, and what was the role of the, the academic component, um, and what other kinds of people did they bring in. And they found that there are these three models. So one is the lab model, um, and the lab model, is characterized by having an inventor that really has a vision for their technology and they only want to develop that technology and have it deployed in a particular way. And that person typically wants to stay in their faculty position. So when they're building the team, they're oftentimes looking for a single keystone person that's very trusted, maybe someone that was their graduate student, that shares their vision and that they believe will follow their intentions. Um, oftentimes that's gonna be someone from their existing network, so they're not going to be going out on um, you know, posting jobs on LinkedIn or really opening it up to a broad audience because it has to be someone that they have that existing relationship with. And because the inventor in this case has a specific vision and they don't wanna to have to yield to outside influence, a lot of times they'll delay raising money. Um, and so it's important to think about if you are the non-faculty member of this team, if you are really interested in pursuing the most growth, but the faculty member really wants to sort of delay outside influences, you might be misaligned in what you're trying to do. And the second is the gig model. And here, the inventor plans to participate actively. Um, they also want a fairly narrow scope. 
but they view the technology as pretty much done. So in the previous model, they're looking for a partner that has technological expertise and business expertise because the technology still needs some development. Um, here, they're often just looking for someone that can handle all the business components. And oftentimes, they won't seek outside funding because they don't need it for the fairly narrow market that they're going for. And then the last model we have is the enterprise model. And this is the one that has ambitions for more growth. Um, the inventor may view their invention as having a lot of different applications and they want to be able to pursue multiple markets. And so they're going to add more people. Um, they're probably going to add them in batches. So as they go after one market, they'll add several people with expertise in that area. When they go after another market, they'll add another group of people. Um, and because they are trying to grow more aggressively and across multiple applications, they're more open to looking for people outside of their personal networks. So they're sort of making a different calculus in terms of the importance of that trust and existing relationship versus getting expertise in markets that they might not be familiar with. Um, and because they're generally trying to grow faster, they're going to pursue outside investors. And so that means they're probably going to end up with a board of directors that has some investors on it. Okay. Do any of those uh, resonate with, with folks? Do you see yourselves in? Yeah. yeah? Which, which model? I actually work with a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so what I wanted to talk about next is some of the key decisions that you have to make. And um, I think several of you are really have these decisions ahead of you, um, which hopefully this will be a, a timely discussion. So some of the key decisions you need to make as you build your team. So how many founders? Um, to some extent, you may have already made that decision, but there may be people that want to join you that would like to be considered a founder, and so you'll have to decide, are you willing to do that, or is everyone from here on out going to be an employee, um, and how will you treat them differently? What backgrounds do you want those people to have? Um, and the reason I was asking you, what's the current division of your equity uh, is because another really important decision that can go horribly wrong um, is dividing up the equity. So when you look at the size of the founding team, there's some pretty clear trade-offs. Having more people means you have more uh, hours of work that can get done. Um, you have the potential for a wider base of expertise. Larger teams tend to signal that you have more momentum, which can be attractive to investors and can allow you to grow more quickly. Uh, but the downsides, like any larger team, um, you get more overhead, so it costs more to onboard these people and, and pay them, so you're gonna, your burn rate will be higher. Um, and you'll have greater coordination costs. So the more people you have, the more difficult it is to get everyone on the same page. And when you're trying to move quickly, like you are in a startup environment, um, that can, can be a real downside that you need to think about. Typically, what we see in technology startups is a fairly small founding team. So usually two to three founders. Um, there's a significant number that have one founder, but once you get up to kind of five, six, seven, typically that's an unworkable founding team. And you would, if you have a really large team like that, you might need to think about how to gracefully exit some of those folks. The, the research suggests there two dimensions that founders think about. One is interpersonal attraction, which is not romantic attraction. I would encourage you to avoid that if possible. That really goes wrong. But uh, it's more just, do you have a sense of affiliation um, and rapport with, with that person? So it's based on, do you like them? Do you trust them? Do you enjoy spending time with them? 
And the good thing about having that interpersonal attraction is that it helps you get through some of the stresses of starting a company. Um, but the downside is we tend to enjoy people that are similar to ourselves across many dimensions. So people that are the same age, the same gender, the same ethnicity, um, the same academic background, the same industry background. We connect more with people that we have more in common with. And that's not necessarily the best person to be your co-founder. So the other ways to look for co-founders or early employees is resource seeking. And so here, instead of worrying about how much do I like, trust, enjoy that person, the founder is really looking at what are the skills, what are the network ties um, that this person could bring? And will they bring the human capital, the social capital um, that I need? for this. Generally speaking, um, most founders tend to overemphasize the former and underemphasize the latter. So although you want people that you, you know, don't actively dislike, uh, you really want to think about, is this someone that is going to add what's missing that will help make this business more successful? Because otherwise, um, you know, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot, right? By choosing someone you like and have fun with, but who can't actually help you be more successful. There is a, a book that I recommend reading um, called The Founder's Dilemmas by a guy named Noam Wasserman, who um, was for a while a professor at Harvard Business School. He is um, now the dean of uh, the business school. But uh, he did this really interesting work trying to understand the early decisions that founders have to make. And one of those is this decision about who uh, do I want to co-found with and am I going to prioritize skills or relationships. And he found that you could think about three categories of co-founders. Um, you have your family and best friends, so these are the people you're really close to. They're very high on that interpersonal attraction. Um, you have people who are acquaintances, and then you have past coworkers. And he thought about them in terms of two dimensions. One is, um, what is the cost if this doesn't work out? So if this relationship blows up, which is quite common in new venture teams, um, what is going to be the personal cost to the founder? And then the other is, what's the probability that you're going to have difficult conversations with that co-founder? And so the difficult conversations are things like, I really think I should be the CEO and not you. Um, I really think that I should have more equity than you. I really think that um, your skill set is not what we need anymore, and it's probably time for you to step down. Right? These are never fun conversations, um, but there are some people that they're particularly awkward and unpleasant to, to have that conversation with. So what he argues is uh, when you start a business with family members uh, or close friends, the damage if this relationship blows up is high because not only are you dealing with it with the business, but that's a relationship that means a great deal to you that potentially you know, could, could be damaged or even broken. Um, so there's a high potential damage there. Uh, at the same time, for most people, the likelihood of you having those really honest conversations with family or close friends is also low. Now, every family is different, every marriage is different, every friendship is different. So there are exceptions. <clears throat> but um, in a lot of relationships, people want to sort of smooth things over, and so they'll avoid having those awkward conversations. And so um, he is, you know, advises caution about starting businesses with family members or really close friends. That being said, there are lots of examples of people who've done this and, um, and it worked out really well. But I think you want to go in with your eyes open. So then uh, in the middle, he has acquaintances. Um, and acquaintances 
if the relationship blows up, you care somewhat less, right? Because it wasn't your, you know, your sibling or your parent or um, someone where you have a, a really important relationship. And by the same token, um, you're probably willing to um, have some tougher discussions with them because they're, they're just not someone where you have that, you know, that love, um, the other elements of the relationship that make it difficult to talk about. You know, you're really not a good manager or, or those sorts of difficult things. Um, but what he particularly favors uh, is actually previous co-workers. Uh, because you have some prior experience, you understand that person's strengths. Um, there is, you know, some disappointment if the relationship doesn't work out, but it's not as costly as a family member or close friend. And because you have a previous working relationship, you're more comfortable having discussions about who's really good at what, who's contributed the most, um, what kind of roles people will have going forward. So that's, that's one perspective on this. Um, there are many stories of founding teams that had a falling out for a variety of different reasons. Um, in my observation, and I've heard this from, from many founders, when things work out and when it doesn't work out, is that the relationship changes. When you go from being friends or family members to co-founders, even if it works out, that relationship changes. Um, the Bonobos team, which was two business school classmates um, that founded, and you all know Bonobos, I mean, the pants. Anyone wearing Bonobos right now? No? Usually in an audience of half men, there's at least one guy wearing Bonobos. Anyway, so they started this um, company and they had a, a falling out and they realized they couldn't both stay and so one of them ended up leaving. And they, it was very tense uh, between the two of them for a while. I think years later they managed to, to reconcile. But one of the co-founders said, I think it's, it's important if you're gonna do it, meaning if you're going to co-found a business with friends, recognize that you're putting the friendship to rest. The friendship ends the day that you go into business together because the partnership eclipses it. So it's something to really take into consideration um, that that relationship will inevitably change because you're starting to have to have conversations that friends don't usually have. Um, okay. So hopefully I haven't discouraged everyone who's starting businesses with friends and family members. Um, as I said, many people do it and it works out, but you want to go in with your eyes open and have some of the hard conversations earlier rather than later so you don't um, you know, end up in a situation that you weren't prepared for that is very hard for everyone involved. So the next big decision is equity splits. Um, how do you divide up the equity? Is it equal across the founders or is it going to be unequal? And we have some variety, I think, in, in this room. If it's unequal, how do you decide who gets more? Very tricky, because there are many ways to look at that decision. And all of us tend to gravitate towards the decision rule that gets us, makes us look better, right? That's just human nature. And should it be static or dynamic? So a static division of equity means you make a decision at the beginning, we divide up all of the founder shares, um, dynamic means that you build in a mechanism for that to change over time. So you anticipate that over time, some people might uh, contribute more than others, and some people might end up leaving, some people might never join full time. And so you set aside some equity that you'll allocate later. Of course, it's challenging to make those decisions later, but it's good to have that flexibility. So uh, when you divide up equity, um, 
I'm, I'm curious what the, so, so you guys divided up among the three founders equally. What was the thought process there? Uh, well, initially, um, so in the company that we started in South America, we didn't do it equally. Uh, we brought in a rational where we said, okay, let's put in a bag um, three categories of contributions. Let's say, how good are you intellectually speaking? How good are you at putting hours of work? And how much capital do you bring? And we said, in our company, it's going to be 33% your ideas, 33% your work, and 33% your money. And then I said, I'm going to bring in some money, I'm going to put in some ideas, and I'm going to get some work. So I got 66% out of that. Okay. And then we did the same. Um, when we got here, uh, we found that the three of us were PhDs. And uh, we thought of, you know, kind of like work out evenly. Some of us were better at some, some of us were better than others. And so we threw in the 33% as a way of starting. Uh, and that's what gave rise to that split. That's how you did it. Okay. So you felt that you were all contributing relatively equally in terms of your skill sets? In hours of work and, and of work. capital. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Any other um, rubrics that folks have used to divide up equity? Perfect response. I gave equally 100% to myself. You <laughs> to yourself. Yeah. And, and so what, what was the argument there? Or if it's like, I'm fantastic, I'm doing all the work, why should anyone else get it? I just started on my own, there's nobody. Yeah. I didn't have a problem. Yeah. But have you started giving away equity to Yeah, them? so we, we ended up having 20% uh, employees of options away. Okay. And then I invested my stocks over four or five years. New investor came and he said that we should, we should start reinvesting schedules. Yeah. Extremes from 100% to pretty much equal. Um, so the, the argument for having these equity split decisions earlier is that you get to surface people's philosophies um, and potential disagreements about how equity should be divided up, and you don't want that to sort of come up a year later. And you'd be surprised at how many entrepreneurs don't really think about dividing up the equity because it's an awkward conversation. And so you'll have people that are really working a lot, maybe have given up their jobs, have certain expectations, uh, and then you realize that if you add up the equity that everyone thinks they should deserve, it's over 100%, which um, isn't going to work. So some criteria that people think about. Um, the intellectual property or technical expertise. So if you have an inventor, maybe they're not actually going to be very involved on an ongoing basis, but they created that original technology. And so they should get some equity for that. Um, how much business experience do they have? How much financing did they bring in? How much money did they have their own money did they put in? Um, and another consideration is the date of joining full time. Some people will um, go full time right away. Others, maybe because they have a mortgage that they need to pay, um, will continue to work their full time job. Question: Can you is it usual to make arrangements uh, that say something like, and, and I'm, I'm not a lawyer, something close to, if somebody, if something of that nature happens, the former owners have actually um, privilege to buy the stock rather than it being passed on to uh, a relative of the person. Yeah, so you, you can absolutely have an agreement like that and you can specify you know, that they're that they are able to acquire that equity at a low price you know, because you may not be in a position um, depending on when the life of venture this happens, you may not be in a position to actually buy the equity back at uh, a meaningful amount. So, and you know, ideally your venture investors would be advising you about this because it's a, it's a nightmare for them. I mean, if they actually were funded and then they don't want the, you know, 
co-CEO to be, or you know, dominant owner to be somebody in another state that didn't contribute anything. So you should be able to get you know, some advice from, from investors. And also, um, I assume, I know that Enterprise Works has all sorts of great connections, and I assume that there's attorneys that um, folks get referred to that have experience with the, some of the unique challenges of, of ventures and can give you some some sample documents um, for you know how, how this can be set up. Awesome. Do you agree that any arrangement of like pre-arrangement of equity is just one? Because if I give somebody more equity because somebody is more experienced, how do I know your experience will translate into being beneficial for my company? Especially because you can build it, right? And if I give more equity to somebody who's more intelligent, then I'm telling everybody else that you're less intelligent. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. shouldn't it be something that is earned? Irrespective of who you are. It's something that is earned by you putting a service to the company. Yeah. And so, I mean, there are ways to structure the division of equity um, to, you know, to have a vesting schedule for everyone, including the founders. And if you don't end up lasting, you know, if you leave after six months, then you don't get, usually the way that it's set up for founders, is it's a, like a buyback. Um, so, you know, your co-founders can buy back your shares at a, at a very low price. And that's absolutely important to do. Because otherwise you end up with, you don't know the term dead equity, that term. So dead equity is equity in your venture that's owned by people that are no longer involved with the venture. And dead equity is a bad thing because you would rather have that equity in the hands of people that are actively working on the venture that gives them the incentive to work hard. It gives them a reward for putting in their best effort. Um, debt equity is owned by people that, you know, they're going to enjoy the benefits of your success, but they're not actually contributing anything. So having some kind of a vesting or buyback schedule, um, or having some milestones, like, you know, so we brought on this person to be VP of sales. When you close our first Fortune 500 customer, you get more equity. Um, if you have someone that's leading um, your you know, medical technology through FDA trials. Once you get through the trials successfully, you get some more equity. So there are different ways to structure it depending on the industry that you're in. But you you definitely want to think ahead because, like you said, you, you can't anticipate at the beginning exactly what each person will contribute. So when you say that, for example, uh, schedule of investing instead of putting a a specific time frame, for example, one year if you leave or not. So you, we can put a milestone to be fulfilled instead of time, regardless of the time you? Yeah. Oh. yeah. And it may, one may make more sense in one industry or for one person than, than another. So it's something that has to be negotiated. But yeah, absolutely, you can have a milestone-based vesting. The other thing I would say is beware that, so vesting for employees coming in, usually they don't get anything for the first 12 months, so usually vesting is this a one-year cliff. Um, as a founder, you don't want to agree to that. Like you should be able to, even if you only last six months, you should be able to keep some of your, your equity. Um, so founders are not the same as employees. They're taking more risk. They're creating more value from the beginning. And um, their vesting should be set up a little bit differently. Well, so it's Cosad New Venture Creek. Um, yes. 100, roughly 150 student founded teams will be competing on Thursday. So we hope you all come out to judge as well. And student founders often set up some sort of equal representation in their company. And then it has to get unwound after they graduate, in many cases, because somebody takes a job most commonly. What do you recommend for student founders, especially recognizing that none of them left a job to do this company? They all are maybe a collection of people who've come up with something in an academic setting, but are not yet into the real world yet. Yeah, yeah, that's such a great question, because the student teams, 
they may not have actually worked in the hierarchical setting, really, and so it comes very naturally to them to divide everything up equally. And we just tend to be, student teams tend to be more egalitarian, um, and so that's an easy mistake to make. Um, but I think they need to have those hard conversations at the beginning, and there's a distinction between the person that is convinced that they're going to not take a job, they're not applying for jobs, they're you know, spending all their time on this venture, and the person that partners with them for a class project related to this venture. And you know, even students should be able to have those kind of conversations. Um, and you're right, I mean, if they've already divided up equally, that has to be unwound. And it can be done. I mean, equity allocations can be changed. It's just then you end up getting lawyers involved, and some people some people are gracious and, and say, "Oh, I, I realize I didn't contribute that much," you know. And other people are like, "No, you know, I'm not giving up a single share um, unless you pay me off." So, yeah, they, they need to have those difficult conversations about who's contributing what, and then set aside some equity for later. Regarding the, the, uh, the difficult conversations mm -hmm. you talk about, which is just, just inevitable, what have you seen about a good sort of uh, framework or uh, process for having those conversations? Because I've found, um, you know, perhaps even in my own personal experience, but working with, with a range of founders, that, that's, that's difficult without some kind of mediation, right? Mm -hmm. Some kind of moderation of that conversation mm -hmm. to ensure that, uh, you know, the difficult things are actually discussed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm curious, who did you have play that role? So that? when I was in EIR, um, here at Enterprise Works, I, I played that role in, in, yeah. in a number of discussions. Um, you know, in, in the very, very early stages of, of, of founding Autonomic Materials, we had um, you know an, an advisor and a mentor to one of our faculty founders play that role. Um, but in, in in talking to founders, uh, you know, across our ecosystem. You know, my instincts are to advise that someone is involved, uh, someone who's reasonably experienced. It could be, uh, you know, an early advisor to the company, um, you know, who doesn't necessarily have, you know, a better relationship with one party versus another. It, it's really difficult to find someone like that, but but also who, who might have a best, you know, a, a best. Of, stake in, in the company's success as yeah. well. Yeah, I think what you said is really important of finding someone that that has some expertise in the topic area but also isn't viewed as having a closer tie to one of the founders than the other. Um, it has to be a, an honest broker that, that can come in and say, these are the issues that you need to consider. So. Um, and there is you know, kind of a, a list of things, and we've talked about some of them. There's also questions of, like, let's say founder A um, is CEO, but founders B and C together own more equity than founder A. So if A wants to do something and B and C feel differently, how are you going to sort that out? Um, and one thing that I've found is, um, even if things aren't written up yet in legal documents, having conversations and writing things down um, is often enough that people are kind of on the same page and have a common understanding. I don't know if those types of you know agreements are legally binding or not, but they do tend to at least prevent a lot of conflict later. Um, and I think you're absolutely right that having someone who can help the team talk through, you know, to bring up the difficult subjects, um, particularly for first-time entrepreneurs that some of these things won't have even occurred to them. Uh, is a great idea. And yeah, an EIR would be a wonderful person to do that. Um, I think ideally it's someone that um, perhaps doesn't know the team really well. Um, 
just because they'll be seen more as a true mediator and not someone that's trying to put their thumb on the scale for any one person or the other. So that would be my two cents on that. So um, thank you so much. And as I said, I part two will be next week. So um, feel free to send me a note if you have you know, either things we've talked about today that that uh, you want to discuss further or other topics that are on your minds or problems that you're encountering. I, I would love to um, hear from you because you're starting a company or running Enterprise Works. You guys are really busy. It's an hour of your time, so I wanted to be an hour that uh, really delivers some useful uh, ideas for you. So thank you.